As we begin, I would like to acknowledge that I am hosting this session today from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded ter for territory of the Hokomiom speaking Musqueam people. We have people joining us today from many places, and I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional caretakers of those lands. This session is part of the annual workshop hosted by the BC Agricultural Climate Adaptation Research Network. ACARN is a provincial network launched in 2017 to improve linkages and collaboration to more effectively address climate adaptation research and extension needs in the BC agriculture sector. This workshop is a chance to share knowledge on research and tools available to support agriculture climate change adaptation. It's also an opportunity for questions, discussion, and networking. Before we get going, I want to go over a couple of quick Zoom housekeeping notes. After each panelist presents, we'll have a break for Q&A. Please type your questions into the Q&A box instead of the chat. Um, you can find the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom control panel. Uh, you can enter your questions as you think of them. Many of the participants in this workshop have been doing a very great job of that. Um, and you can also upvote other questions by clicking on the thumbs up symbol. We'll begin with a presentation on managing the wireworm pest complex in Canada with Vim Van Herk. Vim is a research scientist at Agriculture and Agri-Foods Canada. His pest management research began in 2003, and he still is working on management approaches for wireworms and click beetles and other vegetable and crop pests. Welcome, Vim. And you're muted. I am muted, yes. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, perfect, thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity um, to talk about this topic. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, managing the wireworm pest complex in Canada, talking about new challenges and new opportunities. My co-presenters are Bob Vernon, whose lab I inherited and who started this work in the, the mid-1990s and my technician, Teresha Mitchell. And let's see if I can get this to work. There we go. Um, so first I wanna talk about the wireworm challenge, um, the different uh, species we have across Canada, the species complexes and how they're changing. And then I wanna talk about some new opportunities, especially in terms of monitoring these species and for managing them. Um, Wireworm 101, a brief overview. In Canada, we have about 20 different pest species, which are um, quite different from each other. Some of them are uh, invasive species, like these agriotes, and some of them are native species, like these uh, Lamonia species. Um, they co-occur on the same land. What they have in common is that the larvae of all species usually are um, live for many years in the soil as pests. Um, most of the feeding damage the larvae caused is done in spring and in fall, not in the summer uh, so much. Um, and they damage a great variety of crops. Basically you plant it, they eat it. Um, populations typically build up in pasture and in, in grassy areas of your uh, fields. And there are very few effective control options, unfortunately. Um, for any of these wireworm pest species. And as a result, pest populations across Canada, um, across the world really, have been increasing um, in recent uh, decades. The beetles themselves are not pests, but they can be a target for management. So I'll be talking a little bit about managing the beetles um, in order to reduce larval populations as well. That's the overview, basically. Um, they, like I mentioned, they feed on very many different crops. You grow it, they eat it. <laughs> um, the typical life cycle is that the beetles will emerge in April and May and early June. They'll uh, lay their eggs, which hatch after a few weeks into these little baby wireworms, which we call neonate wireworms. 
Um, they go through about nine different larval instars over three to five years, after which they pupate, typically in the fall, August or so, early August, and then they overwinter as adults. In terms of the pest species um, in Canada, um, most of what we know, if you look at the arable land in Canada, um, most of the work we have done um, since 2000 or, or so has been on these European uh, invasive species, three agriotes species. We have two of them on the west coast um, of Canada, Fraser Valley and Vancouver Island is where we knew them for. And uh, three, all three of them on the east coast um, of which AS or Agriotus putator is uh, the worst pest of the three in, um, in Prince Edward Island. Um, however, we didn't know much about the other pest species in Canada. So we've been doing surveys since about 2004, I think we started and we're still doing that to find out what are the pest species in the prairies, uh, Ontario and uh, Quebec. And this survey was only possible because many, many people submitted samples to this and I'll be going over some of those um, results a little bit later in the presentation. Um, but more recently, we've been looking at uh, what are the species uh, we have here in the, the Fraser Valley or in Southern BC we started the survey for these European agriote species in 2017 in BC uh, because we knew they had established um, uh, around 1800 or so in um, and Vancouver Island and the Fraser Valley and to our knowledge they hadn't spread beyond that. So we used um, our pitfall trap that we had developed um, baited with um, sex pheromones for these two species and then um, which, you know, if you find the population, they can be very effective ways of, uh, of detecting this species. And then I went on a big drive um, throughout BC and put out these traps. Um, the, the point was never to, to um, put traps in every town, <laughs> obviously that's not possible. So we weren't trying to be exhaustive. We were just trying to find out if um, these species were moving into other parts of, of BC and, um, as you see um, on a nice circular drive, starting in the Fraser Valley and going all the way to Windermere and up to Golden, um, you can see wherever we have uh, a red dot, um, we found one of the species, Agriotus lineatus. Wherever there's a blue dot, like in Carameas, uh, we found the other species by itself. Quite frequently, we found both. Those are the yellow dots. Um, so basically the species has dispersed throughout Southern BC um, which was a new finding. This is something we only know now for a couple uh, years. Um, if you look at it per year, some areas, uh, say in 2017 around Salmon Arm, we find these very high numbers um, in our traps, like you see here, 2,600 in Salmon Arm in, in the collected over a season. 2018, um, you see high numbers in Creston, Kelowna, Pemberton, Thank you, Marjo, I'm glad you were on the call. <laughs> um, that's the work that, uh, that was ES Crop Consult did, uh, helped us with. Both species in very high numbers uh, are now in Pemberton as well. 2019, you see Enderby, Creston, Salmon Arm, basically wherever we go, we are starting to find them in, in, in high numbers in the Southern BC. Some other things we learned from this is um, cross attraction. So these traps we put out are baited with uh, sex pheromone for two, um, two, these two European agriote species. We also have native agriote species. And in Delta, we are collecting um, agriota sparsus, um, which is also a pest species, but you don't find many of them. Um, in Pemberton, we were finding fairly high numbers of uh, agriotas frigipennis. And this, or last year in uh, Enderby, we were finding Agriotus oregonensis also being attracted to um, the same sex pheromones as these European species. Uh, of the latter, oregonensis, uh, that's a pretty exciting find because it had not been reported for uh, Canada before. And um, it is native to um, more Southern areas in the US. Um, what we're finding as well is that these European species, at least in Vancouver Island, 
and in uh, the Fraser Valley um, seem to have displaced the native species that were present in the last survey, which was done by Wilkinson in 1963. Um, these species I list below here, Corymbetodes, uh, Lobatus, and then this Leotrichus and some uh, Lamonia species um, are still found in say Pemberton, Creston, Salmon Arm and Kelowna. Um, they are pest species. They're the native species we used to have in the Fraser Valley as well. And they are um, mostly being displaced by these Agriotes species that we um, that have been introduced from Europe. Another species we looked for is Agriotis putater, uh, the third European invasive. That's the biggest um, pest in potatoes in, um, in PEI. And um, so we put um, traps out for that as well. And we haven't found it yet. Um, it is on the move, we know. So yeah, it might be a matter of time. Um, some other things, some other findings from this survey is um, co-occurrence. In the Fraser Valley, I mentioned we do find some um, agriotosparsis. We do find some of the native Lamonia species still, very low numbers, but there's some. And then again, these other uh, species that we find in much higher numbers in, in say Pemberton and Creston and et cetera, wherever we find high numbers of these agriotes, we still find the native species as well, pest species. Um, that raises the question, um, are we finding them because we are looking for them? Um, if so, uh, maybe we can increase our capacity to detect them by trying to find um, the pheromones for these uh, native species as well. And that is work that um, uh, we're trying to uh, do with um, Simon Fraser University and, and then Dr. Gerhard and uh, Regina Grease and their lab. Um, together with several uh, graduate students that I'll mention later. Um, once you have the pheromones uh, for these species, that really increases your ability to monitor for them and as well as manage them hopefully down the road. Um, an example of some of the field studies we, we do uh, for this uh, pheromone testing, you see uh, um, one of our traps there out in the field. This was in uh, Southern Washington. Um, this is what a trap looks like when you first put it out. You see the clear preservative liquid, and then when you do your trap catch, uh, very high numbers in this case. Um, and uh, work done with uh, my colleague Haley Catton in uh, the Lethbridge Research Center for one of these Lamonia species. A couple things of note here, besides the high catch um, if of this new uh, of this particular pest species, um, is um, the very short time window. Uh, at which you catch them. Basically, it was two weeks of the whole year where we could uh, collect them in large numbers here, um, very large numbers in, in this case. Um, this is uh, things we learned about this particular pest species and, and its behavior, which we never knew before, um, when their uh, peak abundance is and when you'd have to trap for them um, to assess risk to your field, for example. Field studies on the, the same um, pest complex, uh, the Lamonius native species, then uh, that was done this year uh, in Alberta and BC and various places in the Pacific um, Northwest, where we have the Infascatus, Californicus, and Canis, and a sibling species that is a pest in Ontario and New York that we tested in southern Ontario this year, Lamonius agonis. Um, Switching now to uh, some of the surveys um, that we did in the prairies starting 2004. This was done without pheromones. Uh, we were looking for larvae and beetles wherever farmers said they had pest issues. So this is an example of a field where you have a lot of fire and damage. You see bare spots in here as well. This particular field uh, was treated with the highest rate of insecticide. And the only thing that you see coming up are some weeds. Uh, all the all this, uh, the wheat uh, was um, destroyed. Um, and then people would send us wireums from those sort of locations. In fact, we had about 600 sampling locations uh, over um, those 18 or so years, a quarter of which had more than one pest species uh, in the same uh, field. These were the most uh, important pest uh, culprits. 
and its distribution. Um, I'm just going to focus on this small guy here, Hypnoidus bicolor, and then hip, uh, Salatosomus destructor. Historically, also the main species. Um, we have some more information uh, of these coming out soon in, in the field guide that uh, Haley and I and, and, uh, um, are co-developing. Um, so stay posted for that. That's coming out, uh, out soon and it describes the life histories and distributions and so of these species. Uh, what I, yeah, including maps, distribution maps like these. Uh, this is Hypnoides bicolor. It was the smallest of those two uh, of the species I showed you. And it is uh, ubiquitous. Wherever you look, you find it. Um, but we don't know exactly how much damage it caused. Uh, causes. Um, compared to the other big uh, species I wanted to mention, Salatosomus arapenis, on this picture you see them both when they are fairly mature larvae and ready to pupate. So their sizes are very, very different. Um, Salatosomus, when it first hatches from its egg, is about the same size as Hypnoides when it's about to pupate. Um, so they definitely differ in their ability to cause damage as well. One just seems to feed much more than the other one. Hypnoides has a life cycle of about two to three years. Um, Salatosomus arapenis can live up to uh, nine years or more before it pupates, all the while it's feeding on your crops. Um, in the past, based on what we know from Glenn survey in 1943, in the past, Salatosomus destructor was the main pest species, and now it's Hypnoides by color. So there's been a species uh, shift there. Um, wherever we find uh, those crop wrecks that I showed you before, it's neither of these two species. It's typically uh, Lamonius californicus, the one I showed you the pheromone work uh, for. That seems to be actually the most damaging species. And like I mentioned before, about a quarter of all locations have more than one pest species present. What we just started to do now is um, if you look at the soil characteristics for each um, sample site, you can start to um, do some, some interesting math, which I'll show you here. Um, we did some path analysis. Uh, this is work done uh, with a statistician from the, the Lethbridge Research Center, Tim um, Swinghammer, um, looking at causal paths um, between variables, um, soil characteristics and species abundance. And it can show you some um, some new possible relations um, between variables and, and new research that we need to look at. This is some of the results. Um, if you focus on the third column, the, the, the cation exchange capacity, CEC, um, you see if the salt concentrations go up in the soil, your um, the incidence of finding Lamonius californicus goes down. Um, and only that's the only one of the four main species that seems to be affected by that. Um, organic carbon, um, for example, if organic carbon goes up in the soil, your number of hypnoidus by color goes up and the other species are not affected or actually go down. So different species respond differently to soil uh, characteristics, also to, to each other. Um, second column, you see uh, Salatosomus destructor. Um, if their numbers go up, so does Aeolus melilis. And that's probably because Aeolus melilis will feed on the eggs of Salatosomus destructor. But if Salatosomus destructor populations go up, your Hypnoidus populations seem to go down. Um, so species respond differently um, uh, to each other and to soil characteristics. And these are sort of things you can tease out with this path analysis uh, uh, approach. Um, I was talking about pheromones and um, and, and the work we're starting to do with uh, developing, um, if possible, pheromones for the native species. Um, one use of that is for monitoring um, to see if you can determine virum risk for, for your next year's crop. Um, you can also use it for management, um, for example, in mating disruption studies, which I'll talk about in a bit, um, or for mass trapping to see if you can basically uh, mass collect your um, your beetles before they produce, um, before they mate and produce eggs, um, or uh, in a, attracting kill strat strategies. So to basically lure your 
uh, beetles towards uh, a biocontrolled agent like metarhizium and then uh, giving them an infection from which they die before they can lay their eggs, which is work done with my, uh, by my colleague um, at the Agassi Research Center, Todd Kabalak. An example of how that works, this is some work we did in uh, Prince Edward Island. So you see a nice grassy headland where the beetle populations build up. And if you wanna know where to put your, your traps um, for monitoring or management, um, Typically, you would do it right down the middle of a grassy corridor all the way across um, uh, around the field and then look at your wire number, your click beetle numbers over, over time. Here's one field, one example, and you see we've had, we have traps in the center of the field, brown traps, and then we have traps just along the edge of the field. Those are the light green and traps in the field headlands. And then we look at the populations uh, caught over a season in all three. And as you do that, you see there's certain areas that have much higher numbers than others. Those are your hotspots. And if you target those either with traps for monitoring or um, with a control strategy, you can basically know where you have to go to, um, to eliminate your or reduce your populations. Um, this sort of work, um, done over time will tell you where you need to go into the field in order to monitor and to manage. Um, in that particular case, I called it field 14. You see there's very similar numbers um, of beetles caught in total in all three um, locations. Important is to know your field history. That was work done in 2016 and the beetles that we collected in 2016 came from eggs that were late in 2012. 2012, the field had winter wheat, which is a great place to, if you're a beetle, to lay your eggs. But the following year, the farmer uh, planted potatoes um, and he used thymet as an insecticide. You'd expect that that would have killed all your wireworms. Um, thymet is very toxic to wireworms, but it um, evidently didn't because, well, we can speculate at this point, but um, your field history, it's really important to understand the dynamics of a population in the field. Um, so we've scaled this, we scaled this up by, by surveying um, 18 fields in um, 2016 and then repeating that for, um, for, several, for four years. So we had beetle numbers in, per week over a 14 or 16 week period in each of these fields, uh, at least in the headland locations. And that sort of database lets you determine um, how stable populations are over time. And if you can correlate beetle numbers to wireworm risk, if um, numbers in the field are similar from one year to, uh, to the next, and how crop, cropping history uh, affects that. And if hotspots in the field, if it's in the same location what, uh, year after year, or if it shifts around. So there's a lot of analysis that still needs to be done there. Um, shifting to uh, study another application of pheromones beside monitoring is mating disruption. This is our research center in Agassiz. Um, this is um, a study that we're doing with pheromone uh, granules in these little strips of grass. If you go uh, to the ground level, that looks like this. Um, strips of grass separated by soil. There's uh, Teresha, my technician, uh, applying these pheromone granules, which are little beads of wax that are treated with pheromones and they're sprinkled in this grass and it makes the entire grassy strip look uh, or smell like, uh, like female click beetles and the males run around madly looking for females and in the process they forget to actually um, find the real females which remain unmated and hopefully you don't produce more uh, Wireworms, the next generation of wireworms. So it is a pay it forward strategy. strategy. You are not actually reducing populations of wireworms in the field. You're preventing the formation of next year's um, um, population. And then you do a lot of soil sampling to see how many larvae are in the different treatments and all the soil samples need to be extracted with these uh, funnels. Um, a third application of pheromones is these pheromone curtains, as we call it. Um, you can put these rows of pheromone traps uh, along a field edge. They produce pheromone. Um, 
that attracts the males. So when the males emerge in spring, they basically get intercepted uh, by these traps. Um, they don't mate with the females um, and the females um, therefore you know, don't lay the next, uh, don't lay uh, viable eggs. That's the theory uh, of how it's supposed to, to work. Um, so that's a mass trapping strategy. Um, Shifting uh, to new insecticides um, that uh, we've been testing in the in the lab in our uh, program since uh, we lost Lindane in 2004, uh, there's been a need for new uh, chemical control products, um, which we've um, done screening studies with wheat in the lab and in the field on a whole variety of different um, insecticide classes. Uh, we found that uh, many of them don't actually kill our uh, kill wireworms, they intoxicate them for a while and then they recover or they repel them or they are effective but you just can't get it registered for uh, various reasons. Um, uh, we were very, very glad that um, in October this year, uh, a new insecticide was registered, uh, broflanolide, it's a new mode of action and it's been uh, registered on cereals, potato and corn um, some early work as uh, showing you here, these two plots, uh, the control plot had uh, no, wire, no uh, wheat plants really because the wireworms took care of them. And you see very good stand protection in the, the, the cereals when, or the wheat when it was treated with um, broflanolide. Um, so that was promising. Uh, it gave stand protection, but we didn't know if it would actually also um, kill wireworms, right? It might have repel or immobilize them or intoxicate them temporarily. So we went in and did bait trapping the following spring. And uh, in these two particular studies, we noticed uh, an 85 or 86% uh, reduction in two separate studies in, uh, in the wire room numbers. So that was really promising. And um, in the following years, because that was 2012, in the following seven years, we repeated this uh, work um, to compare your control um, stand with wheat uh, treated with thiamethoxam or two um, rates of uh, broflanolide, two very low rates, two and a half and five. Uh, and you see a uh, very good uh, stand protection equal to say thiamethoxam. Um, if you look at your wire mortality, uh, the control bar is being white, 100% survival of course, Thymethoxam, sometimes you have even higher numbers in those plots than in the control, and typically around 70, 80, 90% reduction in wireworm numbers for these two uh, rates of brofilanolide. So very consistent results from year to year. So that told us hey, that- is Yes? Sorry, you only have a little bit left so that we can allow some time for questions. Okay, I'll speed up. <laughs> Broflanolide, um, so we know it's effective at uh, the five gram uh, rate. Um, it gives stand protection and viral mortality. So how can you use it? You can use it as a cereal um, seed treatment. You can use it um, in crop rotation as a cleanup crop because we know it will kill all stages of uh, wireworms, uh, all generations. So you apply it uh, one year and the next couple of years you'll have much lower risk to your uh, to uh, crop damage from wireworms. Um, you can use it as an inferno attract and kill uh, strategy where you put it on the wheat and you sprinkle the wheat in with your potatoes um, and the, the potatoes overtake the wheat. It does not cause a, a, a decrease in, in, that, in um, yield, for example. Doing that allows you to really reduce the amount of insecticide you put in the field for example, fipronil would be applied in potatoes at uh, 3,250 grams active. If you put fipronil on, I said fipronil, I meant thymine. If you put um, fipronil on wheat and use it as a broadcast sprinkle, you can use it at 1.7 grams active. If you multiply that by your um, the LD50, mammalian LD50 of those two chemicals, you're actually reducing the risk to um, of these chemicals you're putting in the field by 172,000, just pretty ridiculous. Um, 
if you compare that to broflanolide, which you might be applying at slightly higher rates, um, the mammalian toxicity is much lower. We're talking two to 5,000. And I've compared that to ibuprofen and aspirin right, right there. Uh, so it's safer that way. Um, you can also use uh, broflanolide directly as an inferro spray. Um, I'm almost done, bear with me. Um, inferro spray right onto your potatoes. Doing that, you'll see, and I'll skip through this very quickly, you, uh, your, um, your tuber blemish reduction will, is around 97%. This is work done in 2018. And your wireworm number reduction, this is the last number here, is 99%. Uh, similarly, uh, work we did last year showed a tuber blemish reduction of 94 to 97%. Um, and a wireworm population, a reduction of 98%. This is at a very low um, rates. These are the rates of uh, thymet that are typically used, um, 3,200 grams, and I got poncho in capture here as well. Um, if you look at um, the inferro spray of broflanolide at 0.25 grams active per 100 meters, you're only putting 25 grams active per hectare. If you apply it to wheat, you might be able to reduce this even further, uh, shown here. And with that, I am coming to my second last slide. Uh, future directions of our, not too fast now. Um, future directions here. Um, what we wanna do, do next with this sort of work, we wanna develop more monitoring and management tools, both chemical and non-chemical. I know I talked about broflanolide, um, we're not only uh, nozzle heads, we do like to use non-chemical control management tools if we can. Um, we wanna develop uh, risk rating systems for these different species complexes, also to see how they're changing over time. And if possible, we'd like to do some more biology and life history studies of the, of, especially of the native species that are fairly um, understudied at this point. Um, that is pretty much, I think, where, uh, where I've got it, except I have one more slide. I just wanted to say a special thank you to my technician and to all the wonderful students that we've had over the years. Um, my contact information is there and there's um, a little plug for a book um, which has a whole chapter on wireroom biology and history um, if for further reading, should you be interested. And with that, um, I have time for questions, I hope. Thanks so much, Vim. Um, well, we have time for about two questions. So right now we have two questions in the Q&A. Uh, feel free to uh, enter in any other questions that the, you might have. Um, the first question is from Emily. When is the Wireworm Field Guide coming out and where can we find it? The Wireworm Field Guide has, that's, um, it is specific for the prairies. Um, um, it, um, is an Agriculture Canada publication, so it needed to be translated into French, which has been done. And it is at a copy editing stage right now. We are anticipating uh, the first quarter 2021. And it would be on an Ag Canada website. If you have difficulty finding it, uh, let me know and I'll try to, I'll just email you a copy. Um, All right, and our next question is from Alison Fox. Can chickens be used to assist in controlling wireworm or beetle populations? That, that question has been has come up um, quite a few times and, and I, I, um, I, I really like it. <laughs> it's, um, for, so all your beetles will be coming up uh, at some point in spring. So if your chickens are running around, um, say uh, between uh, the middle of April to uh, middle of June, um, you have a pretty high likelihood of uh, the chickens <laughs> finding them and, um, and, and, and eating your, your beetles. Um, um, so, so because all your beetles will be above ground. So um, for your larvae, um, they will go down pretty far into the soil profile and especially in summer, uh, they can be, uh, you know, a meter down. Um, so 
they typically stay well below the soil surface. So unless they uh, the, the, they come within an inch or, or so of the soil surface, I, I'm not sure your chickens are going to get to them. So um, if you if your chickens can take care of the beetles, you still have your larvae in the field. So you'd have to do it for a number of years before you gradually deplete the population. Um, it, it, so it's not magic, but you know if you have few options. Uh, mm -hmm. Worth trying for sure. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much, Vim. Uh, yes. Uh, next up, it's my pleasure to introduce the developing IPM field guides for small scale vegetable growers. Drew Yates and Marjo Desiro are both joining us today from ES Crop Consult to share their work and answer your questions. Drew is a consultant with ES Crop Consult, where she works on farms throughout the Fraser Valley in pest and nutrient management. And Marjo has worked with ES Crop Consult since 2008, where she specializes in IPM for seed potatoes, organic vegetables, and cranberries. Marjo is located in Pemberton. After Drew presents, we'll have a break for questions before going on to the next presentation. Go ahead, Drew. Great, thanks so much, Chelsea. Um, so yeah, I'm here to talk about these um, IPM field guides that we developed for vegetable production. I'm just gonna bring up Nadia's smiling face while I uh, give a bit of an intro. So basically, um, since 2019, uh, Marjo and I have been working on a project where we developed 12 different IPM field guides, which are gonna be released in this coming spring. Um, Six of those field guides are for veg crops and six were for berries. Um, and we, yeah, part of why I brought Nadia's smiling face up, Nadia is one of the grower collaborators that we worked with um, during this process uh, from Pinch of Soil Farm in Langley. And um, that's part of this project is that we worked really closely with growers in the creation of these field guides. So I'm gonna speak a bit to our experience with that. Um, and yes, I'm the one presenting, but I just want to mention that Marjo is uh, actually the lead on this project and she's based out of Pemberton. So that's another part of this project. We did work in the Fraser Valley and Pemberton uh, Valley uh, with the farms that we worked with. Okay, so I'm going to get uh, Shauna to put up a poll here. And my question for the audience is, did you attend my talk yesterday on very IPM field guides? I'll give people a couple moments to respond. All right. Okay, a decent split, slightly more no's. Um, <laughs> Uh, for those of you who did attend my talk yesterday, I'm just going to apologize now for some of the inevitable repetition that is going to happen. Uh, so apologies in advance for that. I do promise that uh, we're going to talk about vegetables, though, instead of berries at the very least. So um, and one thing I want to say right now before I get into the talk is that I think that there are a number of people in the audience um, who have experience in developing um, management tools and resources for growers in various ways um, and uh, folks who are growers as well who are in the audience and so I'm really curious to hear about how our experience experience and process kind of compared to your experiences in in this sort of work so um, something to keep in mind while you're listening to me talk about what we went through um, okay so here is a general timeline for this project. In developing these field guides in 2019, that was the year that we really focused on creating drafts of these field guides. In 2020, we did test runs of them in the field. Um, and then in this coming year is when we are hoping to release them into the world to do their thing. Um, and it was in 2019 and 2020 that we had these farm visits that were ongoing over two different seasons. And I want to speak to uh, what I mean by small scale when I'm talking about us developing uh, field guides for small scale operations. Um, so basically in this project, we define small scale as being less than 15 acres in, in uh, total area for, for that farm operation. Um, but really what Marjo and I were focused on was um, Farm operations that are kind of smaller than the norm or smaller than 
what typically management resources are tailored for, um, trying to serve this group of uh, small scale that um, maybe is not being served in other ways through other projects. And the reason for that is because that's a gap. That's clearly um, a group of growers that um, has a need for these sorts of resources. So um, yeah, these, this gap in pest management activities for small scale farms includes uh, pest monitoring and also just a lack of available resources in general around IPM or integrated pest management. So um, also small scale operations are obviously not a monolith. Uh, they are highly variable in terms of what those different farms look like. And so it is a challenge to make resources that are sort of general enough to be inclusive of lots of different operations, but specific enough still to be actually of use. Um, and so I think that's one of the reasons in some cases where small scale kind of gets left out of the picture. All right, so what the heck are these field guides that I keep alluding to anyways? Um, uh, I'm just gonna pull up an example of uh, one of the field guides um, that's still kind of in its very final draft form, um, just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. So um, this, is, this is what uh, uh, sort of one of these field guides tends to look like. And I just wanna draw attention to this point at the top about how these IPM guidelines uh, that we've included in these field guides really um, are broadly applicable uh, beyond small scale. Um, but we did put in quite a bit of effort to include information that would make these field guides more accessible and inclusive of smaller scale operations. Uh, so yeah, usually these field guides open up with a section about life cycle and identification, um, depending on the guide. Yeah, so some of the identification is around how do you identify uh, the damage, uh, which is true in this case for carrot rust fly. Um, and maybe some lookalikes that are relevant. So that's included in that ID section. We have a section around how to monitor. And I'd say this is where a lot of our energy went um, towards trying to tailor these field guides to be applicable for small scale operations, sort of adjusting some of the monitoring protocols um, to be applicable for that scale. Okay, and then checking my notes to make sure that's all I wanted to say there, yep. Um, okay, and then the next section is about uh, basically decision making. So knowing when to take action um, and when management uh, might need to be implemented. So evaluating risk in a lot of ways. And then the last section is around management options that are available for this pest. And we tried to cover lots of different aspects of uh, what's often referred to as the IPM toolbox. So lots of different options um, beyond just uh, spray control options as well when to act, how to manage. And one last thing I wanna say about this overall field guide layout is that truly, um, you know, Marjo and I were not creating new forms of management or creating new information in a lot of cases. We were looking to compile existing knowledge and compiling existing information in a way that was accessible and usable for growers. Um, and as I mentioned at the top, one of the sort of particular aspects to this project or unique uh, focus was that we were really taking a give and take approach um, in the way that we were developing these field guides. So um, we did a series of farm visits with multiple farms over two different seasons. Um, and during those farm visits, we would spend time asking the growers questions and asking, basically asking for some of their time and asking for their expertise and knowledge. And in exchange, we would then spend some time directly monitoring and providing IPM services uh, to them specific to their farm operation. So we were valuing growers time in sort of a different way than um, is often approached with these sorts of projects. And this allowed us also to gather information in a quite a bit more of a direct way about those farms. So here is a list of the farm collaborators that we worked with over the two seasons uh, for these veg guides. Like I mentioned, there's some, there was also a berry component to this project, which some of you got to hear me talk about yesterday. Um, and these farms were located throughout the Fraser Valley and also uh, through the Pemberton Valley. And oh, one thing that I do want to say about, I'll just go back, about those farms is when we're looking for farm collaborators, Marjo and I were really considering folks who um, perhaps 
would uh, consider implementing these IPM practices really seriously if they were more accessible to them in some way. Okay, so in 2019, our first year uh, doing this project, we were, our first step was to figure out which pests um, and crops we were going to focus on for creating field guides, because um, we cannot do them all. Um, and so as a part of that process to create the pest list, we used sort of four main uh, ways of evaluating whether or not we were going to include a pest. Um, Firstly, we uh, were focused on observations, our own observations in the fields and also farmers' observations, what they had to tell us. Um, we had some consultation with uh, the BC Ministry of Agriculture and a, a big thanks to Susan Smith for, for her input. Um, we also were considering what pests or crops might there be resources more lacking for. Um, so for example, in this list, uh, those of you who grow potatoes um, uh, along the West Coast might note that there's no late blight um, for potatoes. And that's obviously very, very important. Um, but that was an example of one of the pests that we thought there was quite a few resources um, that were available and quite a bit of energy and effort um, that went into that pest in other ways. So we did not select it for that reason. Um, and then the final sort of metric that we used for choosing the pests was which pests would have the greatest impact um, by implementation of monitoring or implementation of more specific management actions. Um, and so uh, I'm going to provide an example of that coming up here. So uh, one example of pests that kind of fit that criteria was the two-spotted spider mites. Um, so these uh, are a mite that feed directly on plants and they can cause damage in a broad range of different crops. And in this project, we really focused on their presence in greenhouses or hoop houses with uh, cucumber production. Um, and they can cause a serious yield loss in high infestations. They're sort of a desiccant in the way that they feed on plants. Um, and they're typically a concern later in the season. They really thrive in hot and dry conditions. And so um, one thing that we found in 2019 is that a lot of collaborating farms had spider mite issues in their greenhouse cucumbers. And it became clear that identification and early intervention were not necessarily being implemented as effectively as they could be. Um, and uh, an interesting thing after we had worked with some of these farms and uh, yeah, Marjo had this experience with a couple of her growers is that uh, some of those collaborating farms and where that we had discovered might issues in 2019 and sort of had those conversations and passed on information and resources to those growers. They then in 2020, um, started uh, releasing predator mites uh, preventatively as a response. Um, so that's just an example of, of this, the reason we selected this pest kind of being in action. So here's just some pictures of examples of really high damage. Um, and basically kind of at this point, the, the spider mites are uh, beyond treatable very effectively. And um, once you know you have really high levels, you wanna start taking proactive measures for the following season in different ways. And here's an example um, from one of those farms of a little pouch of uh, predator mites being uh, set out for release to do their thing against the pest mites. Okay, so then in 2020, we uh, took our field guides out for test runs on uh, farms to get feedback from growers to try to refine them to make them um, even more effective. And so I just want to highlight some three of the main takeaways that we had. Um, one was that uh, risk assessment tools were so important to different growers. So there's lots of decisions that growers have to make in a day. Um, tasks need to be prioritized, you can't do everything. And they need to be prioritized according to risks. And so we took that um, feedback from growers and really tried to um, add more around identifying risk factors for growers to take into account. Another uh, aspect that got brought up by a number of growers, uh, lots of questions around how to deal with infected crop debris. Um, and basically like, how important is this? Uh, can I get away with putting this crop debris in my compost? 
Um, or do I absolutely have to throw it away? Can I deep plow, et cetera? And so we tried to incorporate more information about that where possible. And then lastly, another really uh, common uh, comment was uh, about how important it was for these growers to be able to uh, easily print, uh, print out these field guides because they would throw useful resources that they would find online into a binder, um, or they would share it with their staff team in some way. And so, yeah, uh, we really made sure that ha we would format these things in a way that could be accessible online, but also in a way where they could be very easily printed once they were found online. Um, and then I just have some sort of fun specific feedback that we received as well that I want to quickly highlight. So um, one thing that a number of growers found very useful was having actual size references on these field guides. So obviously this is a blown up picture and that's not a real actual size reference, but um, so we, we incorporated that into a couple of our field guides where we could. Um, another thing that we incorporated was uh, kind of like a cheat, a cheat version of the monitoring. So, um, for uh, some of the farms, there's obviously a million things going on and it's hard to incorporate monitoring. And so we provided this fast monitoring version of things um, so that growers, uh, you know, if they were really slammed and uh, only had the most smallest amount of time and energy to be able to put into looking for something, here's an option available to you. Um, and then another thing uh, that was interesting was how important it was to be as specific as possible when describing some of the monitoring activities. So um, we discovered like through experience of being in the field and speaking with some of the growers that in describing how to look for thrips on uh, onions, for example, that we need to, to not just say, look for thrips on, on, on onions, we needed to say, um, pull apart the leaves and look down to the very base of those onion leaves to, um, to scan for thrips. And so that was, yeah, just interesting to note how specific wording needs to be to make that information useful. And I have a few other comments that are sort of outside the scope of this project. So they're not things that we incorporated um, into the field guides, but I do think they're of interest potentially for some of the folks in the audience who are wanting to uh, perhaps pursue similar work. Here's some potential ideas. Um, one of the biggest challenges that growers had across the board uh, was around weed management. And um, yeah, so having more resources uh, developed around that, perhaps field guides structured really similarly to this, but just about weeds. Um, uh, another comment that came up was around um, basically like best management practices for different types of management that we might be recommending. Um, and this was true for row cover. So row cover is sort of a management option that we've provided in these field guides in sort of general terms. But we had multiple farms saying, um, you know, like we use row cover for lots of different reasons and for different pests. And it would be so valuable to have a document outlining some of the best ways to implement row cover effectively. Um, so that was really interesting to hear. And then I'm mentioning crop residues again, and this is because um, even though we did our best to uh, try to incorporate information about crop residue management into the field guides, Marjo and I found actually that it was just really challenging to find this information in the first place um, to compile it somewhere. Uh, so this would be uh, a really useful thing to develop more information around. Um, it's not a typical part of IPM information that's available online or um, is, seems to be of common knowledge, and, and that would just be really helpful. Okay, so looking into this next year is when we're uh, planning to release these field guides into the world, and we're hoping to distribute them as far and wide as possible. Um, via farmers institutes or growers associations. And I'm gonna make a plug here for, uh, if you are interested in receiving these, please contact us. I've just put Marjo's email up on the screen. Um, uh, we have a whole year for distributing these uh, field guides, which is a bit atypical. Often for projects, you kind of have one point in time where you're distributing um, outreach materials. 
So we'd really like to take advantage of that as much as possible. So if you're interested, please get in touch. Um, and also um, as a part of this project, there, are, there were IPM workshops that were planned um, as a part of delivering this information to growers. Um, originally we had one planned in the Sea to Sky and one in the Fraser Valley, um, but obviously we're looking to re-strategize that in the face of COVID. And um, so we might be using a suggestion that we got from uh, a couple of the berry growers actually about making demo videos um, related to some of these monitoring protocols and beyond. So um, stay tuned for exactly what those will look like, but if you're interested in receiving these IPM workshops in some form or another, also please get in touch with Marjo and I'm gonna bring up her email at the end as well. So, um, so just to, to summarize um, the, the two main points that I really want you to take away from, from this talk uh, here and now is just that that direct consultation with growers directly on their farms um, and, and prioritizing that as much as we did in this project was so invaluable. It was invaluable to us. It was so appreciated by the growers that we collaborated with as well. They really felt like their time was valued. And um, yeah, it, that was just a really, really great and important part of this project, I think. Um, and just to, to get excited about the field guides that are coming out this next year and to please get in touch if that's something that's of interest to you. Um, so I would like to just thank all of the funders of this project, the BC Strawberry Growers Association, the BC Blueberry Council, the Raspberry Industry Development Fund, the Lower Mainland Horticulture Improvement Association, and CAP through the Climate Action Initiative. And of course, a big thank you to all of our farm collaborators. We truly could not have done this and these field guides would not be um, at the level that they are without you. Um, and with that, I would love to uh, take some time for questions. I've put some questions up just to get people's brains going. Um, if they're feeling stuck for questions, these are the questions that I would be curious to know uh, answers from from all of you who've been listening. Um, but thank you. Thanks so much, Drew. It seems like we have a lot of excitement about these field guides uh, just within the Q&A so far. So that's great. Um, we have a few questions uh, already in the chat or in the Q&A box, sorry. Uh, so you have vegetable growers in the Fraser Valley and the Pemberton Valley. Can you touch on whether they are similar in size or if they have different management strategies? And are larger growers more likely to adopt your field guides? Marjo, do you wanna to answer sure. that? Yeah, and thank you, Drew, for presenting. Um, so I would say the Fraser Valley has uh, more medium to large size growers compared to Pemberton. I would say here in Pemberton, the, land, the landscape of vegetable farming is very much small scale. Um, and then some medium scale farms that mainly grow uh, potatoes and carrots. Uh, so larger scale growers are more likely to hire a consultant, uh, whether any in any region, if consultants are available or have in a house, you know, sort of person that do IPM. Um, and so, um, yeah, so mainly we chose, Pem we wanted to have farms in Pemberton because it is a hotter and drier growing area. So we felt that it was important to represent another sort of um, uh, an area that had other conditions in the Fraser Valley. I think just to add to that, like one interesting aspect of some of the smaller scale grower operations is that often those growers are, they're able to be out in their fields in ways that like really uh, large scale growers uh, are not able to walk through all of their fields in a, in a day and, and so regularly. And so I think like by equipping some of these smaller scale growers with some of this information and things for them to look out for, they can do that monitoring and they can really implement some of that stuff so much more directly themselves than, than, uh, than larger scale growers are even capable of really. Great. Is there um, any plans or interests uh, to capture pest monitoring data and making it available perhaps for some priority pests, whether that's wire worms or spotted wing for our berry producers? That's a great question. Um, it would be awesome if we could 
all get organized and share more with producers. But definitely, if you see a researcher working on a pest, like get in touch. They'll be super happy if you get in touch with them. Um, also, I encourage farmers institutes to get together to collect and in collect information. Uh, I'm um, wanting to build a project, for example, here in, here in Pemberton, where we share carrot rust fly data uh, through via email through Farmers Institute. So this is also one way to to share amongst growers. Um, I mean, I know Instagram is also very you know sort of popular, and growers share that way. But uh, if it was more private, then um, also through the Farmers Institute, that's a good way to share data. But reach reach out to researchers if you know that they're working on something. They'll be really happy. Cool. Uh, is there a plan to regularly update these field guides every few years or create new ones as needed? Are there thoughts about including a video segment of how to inspect your plants properly? Um, yeah, I, I'll speak to the, the video segment a little bit more. That is a suggestion, yeah, that came up with from a couple of growers. And, and I think uh, that's something that uh, we will be considering a bit more seriously because of COVID um, as well. Like that maybe kind of puts that more directly in the scope of our project now um, from what it, it was before. Um, and I think that that's an excellent, I think it's a great suggestion just in terms of accessibility of information too, like to, to read through um, all of those words in the middle of the field season um, can feel a lot more of a, ba a barrier than uh, clicking on a minute and a half uh, long video. So. Yeah, I think that's something that we're going to be looking into a little bit more. Um, could you repeat the first part of that question? Totally lost the question as I moved it to the answered segment. <laughs> yeah, it was like, did you remember it? updating the updating with relevant pests as they come in. Right. Um, Marjo, do you want to speak to that or? Well, as as far as updating the guides. Uh, I mean, hopefully, it would, it's a great idea. Um, hopefully, we can do that. Um, I mean, we're not in that phase right now, so I can't really speak to how they're going to, you know, be hosted online and easily sort of, um, yeah, the online version at least could be easily sort of updated. Uh, and as far as new pests or other pests, of course, we only worked on like 12 pests, so there's much more work that we can do. Um, so hopefully that can yeah, that can merge into something even bigger in the long term. Yeah, and are there any plans to help train other agrologists on using these guides or on farm support uh, outside of the lower mainland where there aren't as much support and services? Um, so currently, uh, really like there's not a plan for um, this, at least in this project, to, to be doing that, but perhaps, you know, the, the fact that this project seemed to go well and um, that growers really uh, uh, welcomed it with open arms and that sort of thing perhaps sets a precedent for that possibility um, in other regions. And I would say that all of the field guides and also the workshops, however they look, um, uh, probably are going to be hosted online um, and that makes them so much more accessible. All the field guides are going to be um, made accessible online and the way that we wrote them was truly to be as inclusive of lots of different growing uh, conditions as possible. So that's where we tried to in these assessment of risk factors include various uh, pieces of information and not write them so that it was super specific to um, the coast, for example. And I think that the fact that we included Pemberton and the Fraser Valley, that really helped us to, it challenged us to write in that way so that we weren't just getting too tunnel visiony into the specifics and needs of a given region. Definitely. Can you touch on how many of the farms you work with that are organically certified versus conventional farms? Uh, well, off the top of my head, I, well, we're, 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 we're all organic um, and we're all certified, um, but I don't know about your, I don't know. Maybe there yeah, was. Yeah, I think, 
that was not, that were not? Yeah, I think that there were a number of farms that I was working with in, with in the Fraser Valley who um, were not certified, but were kind of using organic management principles. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think that, that the majority of them that was true for, and there was kind of a couple that were actually certified. And then just one last question uh, that you can probably briefly touch up on. Um, does the guide contain clear symptoms of the plant's canopy or leaves uh, that can you can monitor for these pests or worms? Marja, do you want to go ahead with that one? So we, in all of the guides, we um, presented key identification traits and also pictures uh, to identify the actual pest, uh, so the actual insect or the actual disease, uh, but also we included damage identification so that, for example, for uh, two spotted spider mites, I mean, unfortunately, often it's detected at the damage level, which sometimes is too late, but we still, you know, sort of presented how does it look earlier on? How does it look when it, when it progresses? towards a situation that is too far along. So we did I like um, put pictures uh, of both pests and the damage to look for. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much, Drew and Marjo. Thanks. So. Really looking forward to this field guide. I know my lab will be getting a copy, <laughs> probably a few. Um, if you have any other questions, um, I encourage you to log on to today's workshop discussion board on Padlet. The link will be posted by Shauna in the chat or on the event, pa event, bright event page and the workshop program. There you can continue the conversation with the presenters and with others that have joined the webinar. Feel free to share links to your own projects or resources that relate to the topic or to exchange further questions or comments. We'll also follow up after the workshop with the session recording and a roll up of resources mentioned today. Thanks again to all of our presenters and to all of you for joining. Behind the scenes, we would like to thank the workshop planning committee, UBCIT, the workshop funders, the BC Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries, and our other donors. Please join us tomorrow for workshop sessions on building robust agri-weather network in BC applying an indigenous worldview to agricultural research and participatory tools for adaptive planning. These interactive sessions will include presenters and breakout discussions. Tomorrow we'll also have a student research forum with student presenters and a chance for graduate researchers to network. You can find the login details for those ses sessions in the Eventbrite event page or the workshop program. And finally, please let us know what you thought about the webinar. You'll be directed to a two-question survey after this session ends. We really appreciate your feedback.